Oh, hello everybody. Today we are talking about this bad boy right here, the Sigma 17 to 40 18 Art Zoom for APS-C cameras. This one that I have here is for the Sony E-mount, but it's also available in the Canon RF, Fujifilm X, and L-mount for those Panasonic or Leica users. Say what you will about APS-C or Micro Four Thirds even, because you just can't beat how the smaller you make the sensor, the easier it is to get really great optics. And Sigma has really continued, as I'm sure all of you know, to innovate at such an impressive rate. And this lens really is the flagship of that innovation. Now, there are often a host of compromises that one has to make when opting for the convenience of a zoom lens over primes. And as far as I can tell, this zoom lens reduces those compromises significantly and really at an affordable price. This lens is the direct successor to the previous 18 to 35 1.8. And in this new version, we gain not just focal range, but improved performance. Regrettably, I don't really have a copy of the 18 to 35 to test this against, but based on some Sigma supplied information, I will be pointing out some of the changes where applicable. In this video though, I am going to take you through my barrage of tests and share some images and anecdotal experience in the few days that I had with this lens. I've split each test into chapters if you care to skip ahead at any time. Let's start with optical performance and resolving power. Thanks to the adoption of aspherical lenses made of SLD glass, Sigma's proprietary version of low dispersion material, the lens produces an almost invisible amount of chromatic aberration. There are four SLD lenses in total and four asymmetric. Some are shared, some are unique to their own. Pixel peepers will find a minute amount of chromatic aberration at 17 millimeters and at 40, even at 5.6, but it's so minimal that it would be nearly impossible to identify in a photograph. Some people would actually call this no chromatic aberration, but in the center of the range at 28 millimeter is truly where we see absolutely none. This effect of slight aberration at the ends, but not at the center of the range, extends to spherical aberration as well. Seeing what I would consider almost none, and very sharp, wide open. Internal MFT charts, which I was supplied, reveal a definitive improvement in aberrations over the 18 to 35 18 lens. There is, of course, some notable vignetting wide open, but it may not be much of a concern, and we will discuss this further in just a minute. Let's now move over to our bokeh light curtain test. We see super consistent and super smooth bokeh, minimal onion rings from the aspherical elements, and no overcorrection hard edge. Stop down to 5.6, we do get that 11-sided bokeh, but it's not overbearing. The edges of the image show some mechanical occlusion, most notable, of course, at the longer focal lengths. Now, this is not unusual because it's very difficult to avoid with large apertures. Sharpening up the image, we see virtually no coma, and thus I would consider all of these attributes to be excellent or overperformance, especially considering that it's a zoom lens and what the zoom lens is priced at. Getting back to vignetting, as we've seen on the chart, the lens has significant vignetting at 1.8, but cleans up quite a bit at 5.6. This isn't such a concern, especially for Sony users who can use compensation, and that will clean it up a bit. Anything else can be compensated in either Lightroom or Capture One. None of my wide images really showed any noticeable vignetting straight out of the camera. This may only really be noticed when capturing an evenly toned scene, which I think is quite rare. Flaring performance is excellent, and internal materials supplied to me show a significant improvement in flare performance over the predecessor 18 to 35 1.8. When panning, there is minimal mechanical flare, and the flare ends quickly. There's no ghost flares, and minimal spot flaring. Something concerning though, which I haven't seen quite before, is a geometric green magenta cast on the veiling flare. It was also apparent in the Sigma supplied flare images. I can only assume that this is in reaction to the lens coatings. I can't prove this, but it's the only thing that makes sense to me. The good news is that in practical backlit tests, I wasn't really able to replicate it, or it just simply wasn't visible. I would give the flaring performance of this lens not an excellent, but a very good score. Field curvature is an optical aberration where a flat object cannot be brought into sharp focus across the entire flat image plane. Instead, the focused image forms on a curved surface, causing only part of the image, either the center or the edges, to be sharp at any one time. This effect is most noticeable in wide-angle lenses and is the natural result of using lenses with a curved surface. With the 17 to 40, there is virtually no curvature at any focal length. This is excellent, tack-straight performance across the board. 
This is going to be an incredible lens to pair with cameras like the Sony FX30, and especially for users who do a lot of gimbal work, because it's right in that perfect range for just about every type of gimbal shot. And the compact internal zoom mechanism means absolutely no rebalancing of your gimbal. And for those using map boxes, you can either lens mount them or rod mount them without any telescoping issues. By adopting the HLA, which is their high response linear actuator technology, this lens, and trust me on this, it is dead silent. And that's including performing really, really high speed autofocus. This makes it fantastic for shooting with gimbals and handheld video production where autofocus functionality, especially quiet autofocus functionality, is absolutely essential. The 17 to 40 also improves breathing performance over the 18 to 35. I measured breathing performance at only 4.7% of the image field, which is virtually indistinguishable. Again, for a zoom lens of this price, this is an outstanding performance. Let's wrap this video up by discussing build quality. Over the 18 to 35, we have a lens that has a greater focal length, better optical performance, and does all of this at nearly 300 grams lighter. Oh, it's also six millimeters shorter and with a smaller diameter. This lens build is strong and well made very much like a professional lens. There's really no parts of this that feel anything like a compromise. And video shooters will really love this aperture ring that is selectable from either clicked or declicked. And the best part of all, it can be locked, which is something that I've battled with on photo style lenses before. For Canon RF users, this aperture ring is swapped out for a control ring instead. Additionally, there are two buttons for autofocus on the lens and a focus mode switch. And finally, the lens is water, oil, and dust resistant on all of its services, but of course, not on the mount. In closing, I have to tell you how truly impressed I am by this release. I cannot recall any other photo zoom lens that I've tested which performed as well as this 17 to 40. There is no equivalent lens on the market at this moment, so it's truly one of a kind. Now, do I think it's a must buy for every APS-C user? Well, not exactly. I'll take me for example. I'm a Fujifilm shooter and I would still prefer the Fujifilm 16 to 55 2.8 because it gives me a greater range and I really don't need that extra stop that Sigma provides. Most of my photography lives around 5.6, and my camera is really great in high ISO performance. However, if you want it to have that full frame 2.8 zoom look, well, this is the lens that's gonna give you that without a speed booster. I'm not here to sell you on this lens. Like me, you have to decide if it has the right attributes for how you shoot. But for a majority of photographers, this lens is going to be a no brainer, and my hat's off to Sigma for pushing the limits of what's possible with zoom lenses. For me, for now, I'm out, peace.